You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. This is Talking Headways, a weekly podcast about sustainable transportation and urban design. I'm Jeff Wood. This week, we're joined by Kyle Rowe, Global Head of Government Partnerships at SPIN. We chat with Kyle about his work with Seattle DOT transitioning from dock to dockless bike share, the impact of ride hailing on micromobility adoption, and the future of his industry. Stay with us. Today's podcast is brought to you by our super generous Patreon supporters. Thank you infinitely for supporting the show. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash the overhead wire. Today's podcast is also brought to you by the numerous projects of the overhead wire, our 14 year old daily newsletter, where you can sign up for a two week free trial by going to the overhead and our audiobook production of Raymond Owen's 1909 classic town planning in practice. Pick it up and listen to it as a podcast by going to theoverheadwire.com or raymondunwin.com. Before we get to this week's show, I want to let folks know that they can get this podcast wherever you find your podcasts, including iHeartRadio, Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, and of course, Apple Podcasts. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And subscribing means you get both this show, Talking Headways, and Mondays at the Overhead Wire, where this music I'm talking about comes from, on the same feed. Two fun podcasts, one great channel. Subscribe today. Well, Kyle Rowe, welcome to the Talking Headways podcast. Thanks for having me. So before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, certainly. So again, my name is Kyle Rowe. I'm the Global Head of Government Partnerships at SPIN. So my role at SPIN is to basically lead SPIN's entry into new cities. Our team manages the relationships with city DOTs, government agencies, basically all around the world. And really what we're doing in the big picture is kind of tracking the regulatory framework and trying to push our industry towards a model that works for both industry and city governments. And, and that kind of speaks to how I got into the space, which is prior to being at SPIN, I worked at the Seattle DOT for five years, working on pretty much all things bikes. But my last role before joining SPIN was to oversee our bike share program. And that's a whole story in itself that maybe we'll get into in more detail, but we'll we'll cut to the end, which is that I basically brought dockless multi-vendor bike share to Seattle. And it was the first city to do that model, to lead the way on that regulatory framework. And, you know, when we were, when we were doing that, the idea we had, the kind of motivation for it was obviously to bring bike share back to Seattle, but also to kind of figure out how private mobility players and city governments can have a more collaborative relationship and try to strive towards shared goals that we have and and still maintain order. A lot of the, you know, the impacts from the Uber and Lyft expansion era were still being felt by cities. And so that was the impetus for it. And so since then, been trying to expand that to all the markets we're in. And yeah, it's kind of a little bit about how I got here. How did you get to transportation planning generally? Like was it something that happened when you were a little kid? Was it something that you learned while you were in college? What brought you on that journey? Yeah. So when I went to, to college, I did my first two years at the University of Maryland, grew up in the East Coast, very much in the suburbs, somewhere between Philly and New York in a endless, uh, just, you know, suburbs after suburbs. You needed a car to get around. And that was the only way I knew. And went into college with interest in environmental studies and wanted to, you know, figure out what was going on with climate change, what was causing all this uproar and how could I contribute if that's going to be something that could maybe provide a career opportunity. And I learned pretty quickly that, you know, the curriculum at the time was good about teaching the students, you know, kind of like what was going wrong and almost like doomsday type curriculum and not so much about how it didn't quickly turn into like how you can contribute towards improving the system, the various systems that contribute to our climate change issues. So was also starting to get interested in cities just generally. So University of Maryland was on Metro, the red line from DC. So I was able to kind of go into DC and start to you know, see a lot of music. And my sister was living in the city and started to really get interested in kind of uh, what was going on there. Very new for someone growing up in the suburbs. And then came out to Pacific Northwest for a summer internship. Actually, we were just discussing this prior to the podcast. I was working on Bastion Island and then came out across the whole country, lived for a summer without a car, working on an island that is quite rural with a bike and a bus pass that also got me on the ferry. I was able to basically experience freedom of movement 
that I'd never experienced even in the suburbs when I had my own car and a driver's license pretty much the day I could get a driver's license. So that really like set in stone. I was like, wow, this is awesome. This is incredible freedom. And I was also learning how much transportation was a contributor to you know, the climate change impacts we were experiencing. So kind of just clicked. It also helped that I had a family kind of already charting this path. So my brother is at King County Metro in Seattle. My sister is at Sound Transit in Seattle. I used to be at the Seattle DOT. My wife is currently at the Seattle DOT. So I think it was both like personal interest, but also there was a lot of family support for um, getting into transportation planning. Who's your brother? His name's Daniel Rowe. Ah, uh, I know Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He's been working a lot on parking stuff and um, mm -hmm. those types of things yeah. for a long time. He wants to be the next Donald, Donald Shoup. <laughs> I saw Roe and I was like, I know a Roe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Well, that's really interesting. What's it like in Seattle right now, though, in terms of like the pandemic and how are you feeling about like what's going on in the city transportation wise? Ah, oh, man, the pandemic has been tough. There's been more than just the pandemic impacting our transportation network, that's for sure. So, you know, in addition to the pandemic kind of making the bus a more challenging option for folks in terms of, you know, being near other members of the public and an enclosed space, we also had a, a major bridge need to get closed down, which I'm sure you've, you've heard about. We had a bill prior to the pandemic, but certainly starting to be, well, was starting to be realized the impact of a bill that basically set a limit on our car tab fees, which was a major funding implement for our transportation funds. And that, thankfully, just last week was deemed unconstitutional. And so we can move beyond that. So, so a little bit of a silver lining, but for a while it was seeming like there was just ongoing transportation apocalypse coming to our region. And, you know, I think in addition to what has been continual challenges on, tra on the transit front, there has been also, I think a little bit of uh, less progress on some of the safe streets and, and bike network build out that, you know, is, is really important for our region because there's a lot of congestion and there's a lot of demand for people getting in and out of downtown during normal times. The average bus from a pretty dense neighborhood to downtown is probably at capacity. I mean, the bus that I could take into downtown would be standing room only and you're kind of like a sardine. And there's always room in the bike lane. There's no congestion in the bike lane yet. And getting people on two wheels and getting them to try out that mode, whether it be a scooter or a bike, has always been known as one of the big opportunities for growth and alternatives to driving or, or transit in the area. The build out of the network kind of slowed down a bit and there's been some some recent successes, but yeah, really hoping that we can pick that back up and, and really complete some of the key links in the network. So I want to go back in time a little bit to your time at Seattle DOT. And I'm curious, you know, Seattle saw a bike share program, you know, disappear, but then come back with a different approach. What were some of the lessons that you took from that process as the metaphorical shepherd? Whew. So sorry, that's a deep question. Huh? It's, a, it's a deep question. That's, <laughs> there's some wounds that are still healing from that era. Apologies. No worries. It's man, we had pronto, right? That's what we're talking about. Pronto was our station-based municipal bike share system, very much like the other systems that folks know about, you know, City Bike, Capital Bike Share, Divi, operated by Motivate, very similar to these other systems, similar technology, but slightly different, which was annoying because you couldn't actually work with these other cities to interchange your stations or bikes. There's just subtle differences that, yeah, I, I wasn't part of the procurement process. Originally, I was working on getting bike lanes and taking away parking spots at that time, but when we realized that this system wasn't going to provide a path towards being, you know, financially sustainable or at least financially sustainable in the way it was originally envisioned, we actually tried to replace the entire system with a e-bike fleet. So Seattle I put out an RFP that selected a company to still under the municipal framework of being, you know, city owned and subsidized to operate a completely uh, network of stations and bikes. So all the stations would recharge the bikes and the, every single bike would be an e-bike, which for the market in Seattle is really appealing because you know it's quite hilly. Pretty much anytime you're going away from water, you're going uphill. The public perception of bike share overall was just in such a poor spot in advance of a, of a re-election that there was just no political capital to be spent on bike share. And because of that, as well as, you know, just some original design decisions about the system, it was very spread out, very few stations. 
So that really decreased the use cases of a user trying to use the system. But the reason for that was to basically bring in more funding partners, more sponsors, and to show that the system could be in more neighborhoods and that we would kind of infill stations because of a few things like that, you know, that led to low ridership, which created lower political support for it. We had to basically put it in, in a warehouse. We all the funding for the system was basically taken away. And we found ourselves entering the summer of 2017 with no bike share. So I think, you know, lessons learned from that, the density and the availability of the service is really key to create demand and to, to really get people to find that as an alternative to whatever their transportation choices are today. Also, you know, managing and really being really hyper aware of the political climate and perception of micromobility and how that could impact decisions is key, whether you're in, you know, a public transit agency, DOT, private company, um, member of the public, an advocacy organization, and really making sure that our, our leaders, our electeds know that this is a priority for us. And, you know, we are working to accomplish goals the city has stated they are trying to reach and always showing that we're, you know, working to improve it. So that was a huge, huge lesson learned. Yeah. I don't know. There's lots. If I, if you're asking me that question three years ago, I probably have a whole different list of, uh, of things to respond to, but those are the ones that I think I've stuck. And then you went to a dockless system. What got you to start thinking about that as a way to, to move forward? So when we got the word funding is going to be cut, it was classic like Friday at 5 p.m. news drop from mayor's office, previous previous administration, quickly turned into like, okay, well, how do we decommission? And then it really said, you know, people started to realize like, oh, wow, we are entering the summer, the, the main, you know, market riding season for this market to, you know, see the bike demand kind of go up and take some of the load off of transit and other modes without any bike share. And Seattle's supposed to be this progressive bubble, right? We're supposed to be leading on these sort of things. At the same time that this was happening, there was also a lot of news coming out of China about a new business model for bike share. Ofo, Mobike, actually a company called Blue Go Go, which basically fizzled by the time we were getting any, uh, anywhere near a permit. These companies were making a lot of headlines and everyone's seeing the pictures of the piles of the dockless bikes, but also hearing the, you know, the massive ridership numbers and the huge potential behind this kind of new approach. The director at the time was Scott Kubley, and he was a director of the DOT. And, you know, I had to work closely with him on decommissioning Pronto and, and managing that. But then we started to really think about like, well, could this be done differently? Could this be done without public funds? Also, what's the opportunity here to maybe get the things that I think the average DOT would like to have control over with other mobility services into a permit and have, you know, mutual agreement that these are good for the vendor and the city and get companies to agree to it. And that included things like data sharing, data sharing at the trip level in a format that was safe for the user's privacy, as safe as we could be based off of the information we had. So it was this kind of idea kind of floated in our heads that we could, you know, almost with a blank piece sheet of paper, just start putting down like, what would we do with our ideal permit to kind of bring in this technology, but manage it. And that's how we did it. I mean, literally opened up blank Word doc and are like, all right, operations. What do I want from every company to follow operating wise? Like how quickly do I want to respond to issues? What do I expect them to do to train their staff on deployment etiquette and, and how to manage the, the right of way? All kinds of ideas. And maybe we would go shop it around the department and say, hey, what do you think about this? Like, how should we define the parking requirements? How do we define the parking requirements on a block that doesn't have a sidewalk, which Seattle has a lot of. So we basically put it all out there shopped it around to folks that mostly had no idea what it is we were doing. It was like, what are you doing again? You're replacing Pronto, but you're not paying for it. How's that going to happen? This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but thankfully, because prior to being shared mobility at SDOT, I worked in the long range planning team. So kind of the, the folks that kind of drive the policy and planning functions of the department. And particularly my work was supporting the bike master plan, the 2014 bike master plan. And then I moved into the engineering group. I was a planner by trade, but kind of learned engineering enough to be dangerous and, you know, kind of adopted this plan engineer role and was the tip of the spear on a bunch of bike lanes and, and also managed the bike parking program and kept our annual bike map up and running. So knew a lot of the pieces of the department that could help me kind of craft this new regulatory framework that would reflect a lot of the things that was, you know, really handled by other departments, other divisions within the department. 
put it out there and, and ask for the feedback from the industry and got great feedback from, from Spin, Lime, and a few other companies, Jump at the time, where I think they were just in the time where they're transitioning from social bicycles to Jump. And eventually just said, hey, it's open for application. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. Actually, the day that we had uh, bikes launched for the first day, Spin was the first to launch, I got incredibly sick. I, 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 yeah. kinda, I was like down for a week. It was some sort of fever or something like that, but I think it was just like this fear that I had just unleashed <laughs> thousands of dockless bikes as like apocalypse on our city streets. And uh, I remember just pretty much being down for the count for, <laughs> for a couple of days. And meanwhile, like, you know, it's making headlines. Probably people are running around the office with papers flying everywhere and be like, what do we do about this? The press is asking this question, that question, where's Kyle? Mm-hmm. I was laying in my bed, like probably really stressed. <laughs> That's what usually happens. You work so hard on something. It's like um, when you're at school, you you work so hard until finals and all that stuff. And then when you get home, your body's like, oh, you're done now? Okay, well, it's my turn to yeah. <laughs> take over and and fix you for a little bit anyway. Yeah, that's probably exactly yeah. what happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's that buildup and then the crash afterwards. Yep. So we had Benjamin De La Pena on mm. episode 161 to talk about the new mobility playbook, Yeah. which started to think about equity and data and innovation in a, in a different way. And since that document came out, which I, I think you had a hand in writing, mm-hmm. I'm wondering what has been the response and, and the action to that? Yeah. Wow. New Mobility Playbook. That was a great project. I specifically owned the Mobility Hub portion. So when I joined the Shared Mobility team, well, we were, we were making a team, actually, we called it New Mobility. One of the initiatives that we knew was going to be in the playbook, which was in draft format, was this Mobility Hub initiative, which was an area that I think has a lot of attention in our industry. Most cities are trying to figure out what their role is and trying to figure out how they adapt transit stations to be about options and not just transit and facilitate those options. And so my role with that playbook was really crafting some of the language around that particular chapter. But on the side, I was like heads down on this bike share permit. Evan Corey who I'm sure Benji mentioned when you guys chatted with him, was the champion of that project and and totally owned that. Since then, I think one thing I particularly like about that document and the way that it framed the roles and responsibilities was this kind of analysis of all the different elements of new mobility or shared mobility or autonomous or you know, flying delivery drones, all these new services that are related to moving people and goods and they're new, they're innovative, they're disruptive, and they're often shared and they're often electric. It kind of put out on paper, like we, the DOT, may not be responsible for all. In some of them, we may just be a convener. In other ones, we may be a funder. In certain places, we may just be an enforcer. Like, a, you know, we may have the authority to basically make sure that this operation is running smoothly and not impacting the users. They play a couple different roles, but that's a big one with micromobility is that they're responsible for ensuring that the permittees are meeting their promises. So that was really helpful thinking, I think, for the industry and for definitely folks in the DOT to understand that like, not every idea that we have about this is going to be something that we have to own, that we have to be the ones to implement. I think, you know, a great example of that is like white label transit ticketing apps. You know, we've got one here in Seattle. We've got King County Metro, worked with a white label company, I think it was ByteMark, and they have a an app that only works in King County. And, you know, is that the right path forward? I mean, it's nice to have an, a, a mobile ticketing option, especially now when you don't want to be touching as many things. But, you know, is, is it maybe better to work with a provider who has a presence in multiple markets so that that customer coming from out of town can quickly understand what options are available to them? And I think that's a reflection of how transit agencies, public agencies are, are figuring out what role they have. And it's not always clear. And sometimes you're going to decide to go one route and figure out, hmm, maybe we should have gone another route. But it is helpful to kind of get policymakers thinking about the different role they may have, ultimately trying to make sure they're continuing on towards their goals that they have. Yeah, I think we've seen a lot of agencies do that where they go one direction, they have an in-house app, and then they decide, well, why are we spending all this money when Capital T Transit does that as well, and they're in every city. So it's it's an interesting process to watch. Right. So on that topic specifically, like, should one trip planning app have that availability, or should we just have an API that you know all companies can host on their app? Spin could host it, Uber could host it, right? 
well, okay, it's not that easy because these companies need to have a payment relationship with the transit agency because they are ultimately taking in fare for a bus trip. So then there's this relationship with the, the transit agency that needs to be made to basically pass on fares and you know figure out how they're going to handle various discounts and all that and make sure they're meeting certain requirements. So it then kind of almost argues, makes an argument that, well, this is obviously a multi-vendor thing with some minimum level of service. Like, oh, well, that's a situation we've been working on for the last couple of years about bikes and scooters, but you know, there are some corollaries there. Yeah. So now you work at Spin, which is a part of Ford. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how the company initially got started and what its goals were then and, and are now. They've pretty much stayed the same from day one. I mean, I joined Spin in October of 2017, just last week, I think I hit three years. I knew the company well before that. I mean, we started talking probably, you know, in spring maybe of 2017 when, you know, the news broke that Pronto was going to be shut down and Seattle was going to be without bike share. The goal was always to make cities better for people. It's a very simple statement. We've always put that at the head of our, you know, presentations and proposals. And the way that we want to contribute and, and achieve that is through mobility options. Initially, it was dockless bikes. We saw the opportunity to bring this business model idea to the U.S. and quickly learn some things that were and were not going to work for expectations from U.S. cities for the U.S. consumer versus how it worked in China. But then saw this opportunity with the scooter as, I mean, we both we were scratching our heads like, what is this? Like, why is this getting so much demand? But then realizing like, wow, there is so much opportunity to get people into the bike lane that maybe wouldn't have with a bike. And that actually ended up being proven with data. You know, the first pilot in Portland, they did a survey after and found that I believe it was something around like 80% of the survey respondents said that they wouldn't have found themselves in the bike lane had this scooter not been available, which is impressive for a city that has the highest bike mode share in the U.S. So that was a really eye-opening realization that allowed us to really quickly transition. Also, most of the major U.S. markets had exclusivity for bike share specifically on these municipal bike share systems like Pronto was. So that created a barrier to being able to expand that particular product to some of the major metros in the U.S. And that's kind of where we started and the mission hasn't changed one bit. We've just become a much more sophisticated and bigger organization as years have gone on. Well, it seems interesting when I was doing some of the research on, on Spin and looking back at some of the documents and some of the things that people had said, it looks like with Ford on board, it seems like you can be a kind of a more patient operation rather than try to blow yourself up in the mm -hmm. process of raising money and hyping yourself up, et cetera. What do you think that that's brought to the table in terms of the backing of a larger company? Stability. I mean, it's all about having that long-term vision be at the core of our day-to-day -day decisions, including how my team is communicating and proposing our service to cities. And it's not about these promises of, you know, tens of thousands of vehicles within the first few months that will totally transform your city without thinking about the impacts, without thinking about the time it takes for a new community to adopt a new vehicle and also sometimes get comfortable with the dockless parking environment because most cities experience station-based first. You know, there was recently a, an industry day with New York City DOT because they've been preparing for a, a pilot and have a permitting application process come out soon. And on the industry day call, there was a couple people from each company, you know, when talking about fleet size, because, you know, the DOT was listening as, as, and I appreciate that when a DOT really invites vendors to come in and, and kind of share what they think and ask good questions and listen prior to, you know, basically prescribing exactly how our service is going to work in their city. They heard, they heard uh, fleet sizes ranging from something like, you know, one to 2,000 to 40,000 vehicles <laughs> from the industry in terms of like what they think would be a smart first pilot. And I'd say that's a reflection on how much pressure there can be on certain companies to really show that they have this runway to grow at that scale in markets as big as New York. And thankfully, we can stay focused on what makes sense for the operation and the city and understand that that's not going to be 40,000 vehicles in year one. That's probably not going to be 40,000 vehicles until year 10, 20, I don't know. But for a while, we're going to focus on getting the service right 
making sure that folks know how to use it and use it safely, understanding that some cities just kind of need to start with a small pilot in a certain geography before they talk about citywide. So yeah, it, it's really nice to have that flexibility and backing. And also it feels like, you know, there's that one discussion about fleet sizes and, and cities not quite being ready for what happens on the street with scooters and, and electric bikes being kind of left in places where maybe they weren't supposed to be left. But how much of that discussion was impacted by how Uber and Lyft did things at the start in terms of, you know, coming into cities, kind of bullying their way around and then getting their way to a certain extent? Yeah, you know, there's definitely fear of that. And, you know, to be honest, there were attempts to preempt cities at the state level, even prior to being part of Ford. Spin always opposed those. We put our resources into opposing those state bills. Spin chose to have me kind of at the front of our government relations team. So uh, I was not going to support, you know, state preemption and basically taking the, the power away from cities. And I think that vision is shared by our leadership and other folks that I work with my peers and the policy team and, you know, in our, in our business unit. So it wasn't something that we needed to really ask ourselves, but it is an important value we have. And I think, you know, those Uber Lyft tactics were scaring cities with some of the growth tactics and, and how quickly some companies were moving into new markets, sometimes without notice, unfortunately. However, you know, your question is kind of as it relates to the parking environment and the, the behavior there. And yes, vehicles do end up sometimes in the wrong spot and they're parked uh, maybe in the middle of a sidewalk or blocking a curb ramp. And that's, we have to do our best to avoid that, to educate folks. You have to maybe provide the right infrastructure to allow them to do that. However, a lot of times we hear from the community or from certain, you know, stakeholders like, this vehicle is parked incorrectly. It's been sitting here on this block for two days. It's just, you know, it's not supposed to be here and it's parked in a compliant manner. And the reality is there's a line of cars that have been parked there all day, not moving. So sometimes when we enter a new community, we're often having to get folks used to the fact that, hey, someone did come to your block, your business or your neighbor's house on one of these shared devices. Yes, they chose to park it there. That was done so in a compliant manner. And it may not get picked up right away because maybe it's a lower density area, but that is totally a compliant trip. Sometimes that friction exists. Um, that's just part of a new new service coming to town. Yeah. And, and that's kind of funny. There's When a lot of this was starting up, I saw a number of Twitter posts and things where people were taking a picture of a car and saying, hey, you left your mobility device around, <laughs> around the street. <laughs> yeah. Right? There was a lot of retaliation to the pictures of dockless bikes and heaps with people you know, finding equally uh, horrific pictures of fields of cars that have been scrapped. Uh, so, you know, I think there's always another, you know, way to yeah. to kind of look at that argument. But, you know, we are asking communities to adopt a new vehicle, a uh, new service, a new operating model type, and we're coming into a, a city and a, and a country that by and large knows the personal vehicle. So we're going to have to understand that folks are going to need some time to learn. And as long as we kind of keep focusing on a good operation, I think we can get through those hurdles. How settled do you think the micromobility landscape is at the moment? You know, I think we are really starting to see in the U.S. that we're kind of narrowing down to a few strong players that will probably be around for the near future and, and maybe beyond. I think Europe is still in a place where it's still whittling down to a few folks that will will last. I think there's, when we see, you know, the permit application process in Europe, we still see, you know, like 14 companies applying to some small city in the UK, which is very reminiscent of how the, you know, 2018 and 2019 competitive landscape looked in the US. But that's really narrowed down. Like Seattle's application had nine companies, whereas, you know, I forget the city in the UK I'm referencing, but I know that there was on the average UK tender for micromobility for scooters, really, there's been, you know, 12 plus companies for a market, probably a quarter of the size. 
along those same lines, you know, you wrote a piece recently in the ITS International about how companies like Spin should work with cities and stakeholders. Mm -hmm. But what if they don't want to work with companies? Or what if people who are part of the process don't want to work with companies who are coming into their neighborhoods? I'm kind of referencing this discussion over public participation that's happening in cities all over the country now with slow streets mm-hmm. and all those things. And in some places, there's folks who just are saying like, no, we don't, no, we don't, don't want it. So how do you, how do you deal with those types of interactions as a company, but also as a city? Yeah, that has happened quite a bit. You know, there are still probably well over a dozen cities in the U.S. that have banned scooters. You know, I, my sense is that's mostly a reaction to the type of expansion that happened a lot of those cities are ones that had scooters drop on their streets one day without any notice. Santa Barbara, West Hollywood, Manhattan Beach, you know, a lot of the smaller cities around LA have taken that path. And, you know, I think it was mostly a reaction to the expansion efforts, very, you know, Uber and Lyft uh, type tactics for expansion. And the cities said, you know, we're not going to have any of it. And with this service, you know, we are asking to store our vehicles, our our products on the right of way. So the authority to ban that service is is much more clear. Whereas, you know, uh, TNC is really about a network of drivers and customers that are being connected on an app. There's not actually an, an asset of the companies being stored. So it's the authority is different, but the impacts are still there, right? Because we've seen, you know, transit ridership has been impacted significantly by TNCs in certain jurisdictions. So that's a big piece of it. But then you also have like Montreal is a great example where Montreal actually welcomes scooter companies and they did a pilot where they said, hey, this is the way we want it to operate. We need to have the parking environment be basically station-based, but using virtual stations. And we need to ensure that, you know, your customers are going to end trips in these places that we designate. And you know, Montreal is a really successful station-based bike share system. So, you know, in terms of a city adopting that policy, I would actually say, you know, that's a city I would probably trust to understand the important density station locations. The companies that participated in that pilot, you know, the compliance was so low that Montreal just said, you know what, we're not doing scooters. And they just banned shared scooters, at least not allowed to operate in Montreal. So it's not always the rogue launch expansion strategy that kind of scares cities away. Sometimes it's just like, you know, they they had an experience and they decided it's not for them. So with those cities, you know, I think at least the tactic spin takes is that we want to share how we see our service, our product offering a value. What is it that we can accomplish? Almost every city has stated that they have mode shift goals. They have sustainability goals. They have equity goals. And we can, with our service, we can help towards those goals by providing a green mode, a lower cost option. In the end, they may say, thanks, we're still going to keep it banned. But over time, they may realize that they're confronted with a hurdle they can't get over. A great example of that would be the UK. So scooters have been illegal in the UK for a long time. The code exists for probably 100 plus years. But the service that we operate now is just recently challenged that. Like, hey, there's a device that falls into a vehicle code that was probably not intended by the folks who wrote it when they did. But because of that, we can't operate it. And then COVID hit. And, you know, TFL released a study basically saying how much capacity they could carry versus their typical transit ridership with an average headway. And it was something like the average train could carry 15% of the capacity with the same headways at peak hour. And so now we're faced with this question of like, okay, well, if you want to start reopening your economy, get people moving, get people back into their workplace, if it's safe, how do you do that? Because until there's a vaccine, people probably aren't going to want to get on transit and you're probably still going to be recommending they don't if they have an other alternative. So the UK quickly, you know, legalized scooters and welcomed any city in the UK to, you know, host a trial. And so now we've seen, I don't know, a couple dozen cities in the last three months all put out tenders for, for companies to come in, do a trial in their city. So it's a great example of, you know, maybe they didn't consciously decide that scooters were going to be banned from their city, but they were presented with a challenge and recognized that there is a partnership here that could help us solve this. It doesn't require funding from us. It requires that we change our code and that we work with the private sector to do it right. So that's, I think that's a great example of just making sure that cities know we're available and that we do have a value add to offer. That's really interesting in the context of here in the Bay Area, I know that MTC was looking at like a 60% work from home mandate, which people have been pushing back against because of Mm -hmm. economies of downtowns and things like that. But also Brookings just came out with a report where they looked at a lot of data on a number of cities 
and said that, you know, the average trip is about seven miles, but in urban areas, it's about four. And so I'm wondering how like scooters and micromobility generally fit into those policy prescriptions that are coming out before the pandemic, but also after it as well. And like you said, a TFL's situation, but I'm curious about US cities, how their policy making affects how you all do business. Yeah, it definitely does. You know, we've seen the trends have changed a lot. We've adapted our service and deployed in different areas to, you know, acknowledge that change, but also try to help fill gaps of areas that were dependent on transit and now are being told they probably shouldn't use transit. There is likely increased demand, but there's also, that's why we're here. We're here to help people get around. And we did this deliberately in partnership with cities that were at the forefront of trying to to solve this issue, especially when we had, you know, essential workers, pretty much the only people that were getting around. And some of them didn't have a car. They used the bus every day. We spurred up a number of deliberate partnerships with cities, sometimes with foundations as well, to, to fund pretty much free or very reduced rides for essential workers to make sure that we were getting those very key individuals to their, their place of employment every day. And that kind of framework of how we think about where we deploy and who we're serving has continued throughout the pandemic. I mean, we've seen the heat map of our trips have totally moved out of the downtown into neighborhoods. The trip distances are a lot longer than they were. And there's slight dip in the rides per vehicle we've seen since previous years that started to recover at the tail end of summer. Obviously, weather is now kind of putting us into the down season for specifically our mode in the colder markets, but it was starting to recover and trip lengths have have stayed pretty long. So I think folks are understanding the services is not just something to move around downtown, but also their neighborhoods. And folks are also becoming tourists in their own city, you know, because you couldn't really travel this summer to go on vacation. So our trip distance on Labor Day this year was 15% longer market-wide than last year's Labor Day. So I think people really like found like, hey, what do you want to do in town? Because that's what we're doing this weekend. And uh, sometimes grabbing a scooter and, you know, going to the waterfront or going to some new neighborhood to check out a new coffee shop was what folks were uh, choosing to do. I want to be mindful of your time because I think we're, we're almost out of time. So this will be my last question. You've done Build a Better Bike Barrier. You announced that you're going carbon negative. There was another urban design challenge that happened recently. I'm curious which of these things is your favorite in terms of putting together a process for engaging people. The work that our policy initiatives team does, which is the Build a Better Bike Barrier, the data partnership we did with nonprofits, the numerous street redesign projects we did. We currently have a project in London upcycling materials for building a parklet. I mean, what we've built is a team in SPIN who is working once we're in a market or maybe even a market we're not in yet, but we're actively pursuing, they're thinking about how we can work with folks who already know what's going on locally, who already have the hyper awareness of the needs in their community, or maybe they are designer and they just need, you know, a little bit of a kickstart to get this really cool project they have going, or maybe they're an advocacy organization who's been fighting for this bike lane forever and they have an opportunity to showcase it. We did this in Nashville. We worked with Walk Bike Nashville and during parking day last year, we were able to showcase two blocks of a four block bike lane that has been held up from stakeholders who are really concerned about the parking loss for years. And we were able to help them showcase it by basically finding those local advocates and opportunities and getting them to you know, pursue their ideas and say, hey, spins behind it. We, private company operating in your city, support this. We'll help you get it done. And we want to see you know, the success be realized. And, and hopefully if it's infrastructure, it's implemented long-term. If it's a data partnership or design competition, that it spurs more good work. I think the park with design competition is a great example. We did this in Denver where we invited designers to present ideas on how they would build a parklet that incorporated micromobility parking. We chose six of the designs, gave them some funds to fund the design and come to Denver during parking day and build their parklets. And then we had a committee that went and viewed all the parklets and then we awarded the winning designer who was an individual from Kansas City. He then went back to his hometown of Kansas City and coming off the success of winning this design competition was able to pass a parklet ordinance in Kansas City making parklets legal in his hometown. And now actually has a business where he offers services for building, you know, parklets and other kind of tactical urbanism projects for whether you're a business or whether you're a micromobility provider 
or you need just, you know, a, a bench at your pea patch, he's you know, available to help folks kind of build those the services. That's incredible. We, we couldn't have expected that outcome, but just, you know, getting involved and trying to show that this is what we care about. We help them, you know, kind of spur that change. So that's stuff that excites me the most. I wish I got to work more directly on it, but uh, <laughs> the folks that we have at that unit of spin is they're incredible. Every month there's a new great idea come out of them. And so keep an eye on our website and our, our social media pages, because I'm sure you're going to keep seeing cool projects from that team. So what's next for you all? Oh boy. Prepare for winter. No, um, I'm just kidding. We're, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're working on a lot of markets in Europe where that's, I think that's probably the place to watch spin in the near future. We've gotten a few opportunities to launch in the UK. We're really excited about, we're expanding in Germany and we're looking at other countries as well. So hopefully move in internationally, but continuing to focus on improvements locally. That's going to be the focus for Spin and, and certainly for my team for the near future. Where can folks find you online or wherever you want to be found, or if you don't want to be found? <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to find me. I have a Twitter account, but I, I frankly rarely use it, but you can find me at, a, it's a, at KRO4 on Twitter and then spin.app is probably the best way to figure out what I'm working on. Just won't have my name attached to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Kyle, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. Of course. Thanks for having me. And thanks for joining us. The Talking Headways podcast is your project of The Overhead Wire on the web at theoverheadwire.com. Sign up for a free trial of The Overhead Wire Daily, our 14-year-old Daily Cities news list, by clicking the link at the top right of theoverheadwire.com. And please, please, please support the pod at patreon.com slash theoverheadwire. Many thanks to our current patrons for their ongoing support. And as always, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Overclass, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. And you can always find its original home at usa.streetsblog.org. See you next time at Talking Headways. <laughs>